Hi, and welcome to chapter 17. So in this chapter, we're going to talk about oligopolies, which is when a few large firms provide the majority of the sales in the market. Um, in order to see whether a marketplace looks like an oligopoly or not, you're going to have to measure what's called the market concentration. And I'll explain what that is. The concentration ratio is the percentage of the market's total output supplied by the four largest firms. Okay, and that's largest in... Uh, as far as the number of dollars of their sales. Okay, so the higher the concentration ratio is, the less competition. That means there's fewer firms in the market if that concentration ratio is very high. And uh, in this chapter, we're gonna talk about this oligopoly kind of uh, market structure, which has high concentration ratios. So here's a, an example of some um, concentration ratios for some United States industries. So you see here, video game consoles, this is extremely high concentration ratio. What this is telling you is the top four firms sell, make 100% of the sales um, in the market, in the industry. Um, with video game consoles, obviously, what are these guys? Um, Nintendo, the Microsoft Xbox, and Sony PlayStation. So we actually have probably the top three firms make 100% of the sales. Um, with tennis balls, um, it's the same thing. It's very high. Credit cards are very high. Most of these guys here, um, are would be considered oligopolies. As you get down to automobiles, you see a concentration ratio starts to drop, meaning there's more than four firms, um, and uh, it, it's starting to get on the border of what we would consider an oligopolist. But the other ones are for sure oligopoly market structures. Okay, so oligopoly. It's a market structure in which only a few sellers offer similar or identical products. It comes from the Greek oligos, which means few, poly, which means to sell. So there's only a few sellers. Um, and here's the interesting thing about oligopoly. For the first time, we have this thing called strategic behavior. That means I care about what the other guy does. Um, remember, in perfect competition, I don't care what everybody else says. I just sell whatever the market price is. In monopoly, I don't care what everybody else does because I'm the only seller. In monopolistic competition, I set marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. Um, however, for the first time here uh, in oligopoly, we care about what the other guys do when we're setting our prices for uh, our, our equilibrium points for price and quantity. So this will lead to some really kind of interesting outcomes. And um, the, the study of how these people behave in these situations, or these firms behave in these situations, is called game theory. So we're going to use game theory to try to analyze the strategic behavior that the oligopolists show. All right, so here's an example, just a real simple one. We have a, a duopoly, all right? This is um, just a simple form of, a, of an oligopoly with only two sellers is called a duopoly. Again, that's from the Greek duo, meaning two, and then poly, sellers. So um, this is just a special type of oligopoly when there's only two sellers called a duopoly. All right, and they're selling to a town that has 140 people, and the thing that they're selling is cell phones. All right, and you get uh, free phone, unlimited minutes. And uh, here's the demand schedule. So this is just like we've always been seeing in this, in, in this whole class. If the price is zero, then everybody, if the price is zero, everybody wants to buy it. As the price goes up, the number of quantity demanded goes down. Therefore, it obeys the law of demand. There's two firms, T-Mobile and Verizon, and each firm's costs, there's no fixed cost, so this is gonna make the math easy. There's no fixed cost and the marginal cost, meaning the additional cost of each cell phone line is to the firm $10, okay? It costs them $10 to provide uh, the cell phone line. All right, so let's go ahead and look at this. Uh, revenue, very simple to calculate. It's just P times Q, P times Q gives us zero dollars here, right here is P times Q, it gives us $1,200. I do that for every single column, every single row in this column, I get the revenue. Uh, the cost, again, is very easy. Remember, it's just $10 per phone that they provide. So if the firms are providing 140 phones, it will cost $1,400 because each phone costs $10 to provide. Okay, and finally, then we just go revenue minus cost and we look at the profit, okay? This is just revenue minus cost and that's gonna equal profit right here. So these are all pretty easy to, um, to calculate on, on their own. Now, I want you to look and see the competitive outcome. So this is if there were a lot of firms and they were acting like perfectly competitive market in a marketplace, then remember they set price equals to marginal cost. Well, right here you see price is $10. And remember the cost of each cell phone was $10. So this would be the perfectly competitive output. The other way you can tell is look, 
We know that in the perfectly competitive marketplace, all firms make zero economic profit. So this has clearly got to be the competitive outcome. Now the question is, in this duopoly with only two firms, will it achieve the competitive outcome? Or maybe will it achieve the monopoly outcome? All right, uh, the way to tell this is the monopoly outcome is, uh, the easiest way is to look at the profit here. Remember, th see this is the highest uh, level of profit. It starts going up and up and up to this point, and then it starts going down once we leave this point. In any marketplace, the monopoly outcome, setting marginal revenue equal marginal cost, is the way to guarantee to get the highest profit in any marketplace, okay? So we're looking at uh, the monopoly outcome right here and maybe the two firms will achieve the monopoly outcome. Who knows? Let's see. So if they collude, which means they work together and uh, they have an agreement to make a certain quantity or a certain price, okay, maybe they could do this. Maybe they could each agree to produce half of the monopoly output like we just saw. Maybe what the firms want to do is maximize their profit. So very simply, they could just uh, each produce 30, okay? Remember the monopoly output, go back a slide if you need to remember, the monopoly output was 60 phones total in the whole entire marketplace. That means each firm can make 30 phones each, which if they each make 30, that's gonna be 60 total phones, which means the price was 40 and the profits are 900 because we just took the monopoly profits of 1800 and split them in half here. Um, to get the firm's profits. Maybe this is where they're going to end up. All right, And if they were to do this, this would be called a cartel. So a cartel are, is a group of firms acting in unison. So it's a group of firms trying to pretend that they're a monopoly to ratchet up the price as high as possible. It's worthwhile to note that cartels are actually illegal in, um, in the United States and in most uh, Western countries. Okay, so let's see what happens here. Let's see if this collusion point of the $40 price with $60 total market quantity, i.e. The, uh, the monopoly outcome, is uh, sustainable. So each firm agrees to produce 30 and earn a profit 900. So they're maximizing their possible profit because they're acting like a monopoly together. But the question is, does T-Mobile have an incentive to renege? Or that is to say to cheat? So if he reneges on the agreement, um, perhaps he's going to produce more quantity. Why would he try to do that? Well, perhaps T-Mobile can get actually um, greater profits if they produce Q equals 40 instead of Q equals 30. So I'm going to go ahead and ask you um, to calculate the profits that T-Mobile gets and then if the T-Mobile's profits are higher from reneging or from cheating, then uh, we need to ask is it T-Mobile's interest to renege on the agreement or are they going to cheat? All right, so why don't you take a second and go ahead and do that and hit play when you're done. All right, so here's the answer. Um, if both firms stick to the agreement, remember, each firm's profit is $900. It's just half of the monopoly profit. But if T-Mobile reneges, then it, if it produces 40, then the market quantity total is going to be 70. Remember, the other guy's still making 30 plus the 40 from T-Mobile is 70 total. Okay, so I go over here and I look. Okay, so 70, the price is going to be 35. Before the price, the, they were only making 60 and the price was 40. But remember, because T-Mobile is making more now, so it's going up to it goes up to 70, up here to 70, which means the price is going to go to 35. Okay, so we have this right here. So what's T-Mobile's profits going to be? Well. T-Mobile's profits are going to be the 40 phones it makes, and then how much money does it make per phone? Well, it's selling them for $35. Remember, we got this over here from this $35. And each phone is costing T-Mobile $10. So they're making $25 on each phone, right? And they're selling 40 phones. So together, that's $1,000 they can make if T-Mobile cheats. Well, look, compare that to the $900 that they were making before. So clearly, um, T-Mobile is better off by cheating um, from the monopoly agreement, all right? So its profits are higher if it reneges. And then, of course, Verizon's not, gonna, not going to be left out in the cold here. They're going to be like, hey, I can also make $1,000 if, uh, if I cheat. So Verizon does cheat. It produces 40 quantity. But what happens when both firms make 40 quantity? That means the market quantity now goes up to 80, okay? So it was the original agreement was for 60. But T-Mobile made 10 more, and Verizon made 10 more. So now the, 
the uh, market quantity is up to 80, which means the market price falls all the way down to 30. So now what each firm's profit is they're making 40 phones. Oops, sorry. They're making 40 phones. Um, and now they have a really low market price because it's been driven down to 30. Each phone is still costing them $10, so they're making $20 on each phone times 40. Now their, pro their profits, oh man, their profits just went down to 800. So if they would have just stuck to the original agreement, they would have got 900. But the problem is there's this, because each firm is greedy, there's this $1,000 out there that they're trying to get, but when each person both at the same time tries to get $1,000, they end up with $800 a piece, okay? Um, so here's, here's the idea. Collusion versus self-interest. Collusion means that they're going to act like a cartel um, and uh, produce the monopoly outcome. But each firm has this self-interest, which is the incentive to renege or to cheat on the agreement. Okay. So the problem is, is that because firms are selfish, self-interested, it's really difficult for these oligopoly firms to form cartels and honor their agreements because they're tr they end up cheating on each other. Okay. So now let's see if, uh, at what point do they stop cheating is kind of the question. And when we find the point where, they're, where they stop cheating because it's not, it's not in their best interest to cheat anymore, we're gonna go ahead and call this the oligopoly equilibrium, meaning it's not worth it to cheat anymore, so we predict that the price is gonna stay at that point. So remember, uh, they both ended up cheating from the monopoly uh, outcome and they made 40. So the market quantity is 40 plus 40 is 80. Then I come down here and I say, all right, people are only willing to pay $30. Okay, so it's $30 and each firm's profit is $800. So that was the last step um, from the previous uh, exercise. But now what we want to ask, is T-Mobile going to cheat again? Will T-Mobile cheat to 50? All right, so I want you to do the exact same thing. Um, figure out if T-Mobile and Verizon are going to cheat to 50 and, oops, sorry. And then, uh, so you're going to have to calculate their profits if they do cheat and see if they're higher or lower than $800. If their profit's higher, then they will cheat because these guys are selfish. All right, so take a second to do that and then come back um, after you're done. All right, so um, each, we're still going to start with each firm producing 40 because they cheated from the 30 monopoly output. Now they're producing 40. Each firm's profit is 800. If T-Mobile increases output to quantity equals 50, so if it cheats again, right, they had an original agreement of making 40, well, this new agreement after they already cheated the first time, but if T-Mobile goes ahead and does 50, that's gonna be 50 plus 40, that's 90 total, so I'm gonna go up to 90. People are only willing to pay $25 um, for, phone, for 90 phones, so that's their price. And now let's go ahead and calculate their profit. It's 50, 50 phones, okay. Um, each phone they're selling now for $25. See, this is falling. This is, the, this is the key here. The market price is falling as we sell more phones because of the law of demand. So this is the price that they're, it costs each firm to make the phone. They're making only $15 per phone times 50 phones is $750. Okay, look at this. You see, T-Mobile is no idiot. They're like, if I just stop and stop at 40, stop cheating up until 40, okay? And then once I hit 40 to stop cheating altogether, because if I, if I make more, okay, phones, my profit is actually gonna go down to $750. So T-Mobile, um, trying to be a profit maximizing firm is going to stop cheating once it gets to 40, okay? The same thing is true for Verizon, all right? So we're gonna actually call this the equilibrium for an ol oligopoly, when they just don't have an incentive to cheat anymore. Okay, and the specific uh, name for it is called a Nash equilibrium. It's named after the uh, the mathematician John Nash. You might have seen him. He has a movie called The Beautiful Mind, uh, or It's a Beautiful Mind, something like that. Um, but he invented this idea, and it means that each person, if the two firms that are acting, they will uh, choose what's best for them. They'll try to maximize their profit assuming that the other guy is going to be selfish and try to maximize his profit as well. And when they both reach that point, that's called the Nash Equilibrium. And in our duopoly example with Verizon and T-Mobile, this quantity equals 40 has a Nash Equilibrium, or is called a Nash Equilibrium at quantity equals 40 because neither firm has the incentive to cheat any further. And so basically, it's, 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 another way to think about it is like this. I know Verizon's gonna produce 40 quantity because that's what's best for them. And so T-Mobile says, well, if Verizon makes 40, what's 
best for me is to make 40 as well, and then they kind of both get, quote, stuck at 40. All right, and, and then uh, Verizon has that same kind of thinking um, as well. All right, so let's compare how this uh, oligopoly equilibrium compares with, with the other market outcomes we've seen. All right, so when, they, when, when the oligopolists choose their production to maximize profit, the oligopoly queue is greater than the monopoly queue. Remember, we saw that um, they originally tried to start at the monopoly queue. That was kind of like their great idea. But then they kept cheating until they got to the oligopoly queue. So it's, it, it does produce more queue, which is better for society. But it, doesn't, it what didn't go all the way down, I don't know if you remember, to the competitive equilibrium, which was um, when price equaled 10. So we, don't, we really like the competitive equilibrium. The good thing is that these duopolists, they produce more than the monopoly equilibrium, but not quite as much as the competitive equilibrium. And at the same token, the, um, the price, it's lower than the monopoly price, right? Because they keep cheating and lowering the price, but it doesn't go all the way down to the $10 um, in, like they did in the competitive equilibrium, all right? And so here's why, here's why um, when they're changing output, the amount of profit is changing, okay? So you have this thing called the output effect. So when price is greater than marginal cost, means that when you are currently making a little bit of profit on whatever good you're selling, if you sell more output, you'll because you're selling more, more output, you'll get more profits because you're getting a little profit from each, um, each good that you're selling. But there's also this problem called the price effect. And so when you raise your output, that means there's more phones or more of this good out there and we know by the law of demand, if you want people to buy more, you have to lower the price. So it's lowering the price on all of um, the units sold. So the firms have to look at both these two things, the output effect and the price effect. If the output effect is greater, meaning the profits are going to go up, then they'll go ahead and increase production. But on the other hand, if the price effect is greater, then the firm is going to reduce production and they'll actually make more profits. Okay. How big is this oligopoly going to be? Um, as the number of firms in the market increases, the price effect becomes smaller, and this means the oligopoly ends up looking more and more like a competitive market. So another way to think about it is, as you go from a duopoly, which is only two firms, to a to a oligopoly with three firms, to an oligopoly with four firms, as you increase the number of firms, it starts to look more and more like the competitive outcome. And this makes sense. It just starts going to the uh, price equals marginal cost solution, which in the, the cell phone example was where the price equals 10. Okay, so price is starting to approach the marginal cost, and the market quantity approaches the socially efficient quantity. So if you have um, a way to increase the number of firms in the, in the oligopoly, this might be your best bet um, as a policymaker. How do we get this, the, uh, these oligopolists to not, um, to not take advantage of society? How do we increase uh, output? Well, the simple fact is you need to bring in more firms. And so another way to do that is uh, open up your, your country to international migration, or international trade, excuse me, because this just brings in more firms that can compete, and it's like adding more firms to the marketplace, which we know as we add more firms, we approach the competitive outcome, and this is much better for society. Okay, let's go back to the, to the game theory idea a little bit, and uh, I want to show you another way to determine the oligopoly equilibrium. Okay, so remember again, game theory helps us understand in times, in situations where the players interact strategically, meaning they, they pay attention to what the other guy does before they make their move. Okay, there's this couple definitions. A dominant strategy, if you have a dominant strategy, it means something that you should do because it's best no matter what the other people do. So I'm still looking at what the other actors are going to play in this, quote, game, but I have something that I'm going to do all the time. And however, if you have a, a certain type of game or a certain, uh, we're also, instead of using the word game, maybe we can use um, like an interaction between two firms. Um, and so if you have some sort of a interaction between two firms uh, where each person has the incentive to cheat, that's called the prisoner's dilemma. So we're actually going to tell this story with two actual captured criminals, and um, it's going to 
it's going to have the same problem that the oligopolists have in that they always want to cheat. So here, I'll show this to you. So pretend that police have caught Bonnie and Clyde, and uh, each, ha and, and the, uh, perhaps the police have enough evidence to imprison each for one year each, okay? And they separate them in two separate rooms and offer each the following deal. If you confess and blame your partner, that means implicate your partner, okay, I'll let you go free. But if you do not confess and you get blamed by your partner, then your partner will go free and you'll get 20 years in prison. Okay, so here's kind of like the uh, the rewards or the punishments that they that they presented, and they don't allow the two prisoners to talk to each other. Okay, um, and then finally, if they both end up confessing, they'll each get eight years in prison because well now they confess to the crime, and so now they uh, can actually get eight full years in prison because they confessed. All right, so um, it's traditional in in game theory to draw what's called a payoff matrix. It just looks like this square here. Okay, and then we have two, we put one player on this side and one player up here, all right, and they each have two decisions, all right, they either confess or they remain silent, and this person can either confess or remain silent. This is kind of the traditional setup for prisoner's dilemma. You'll see it in all your textbooks uh, if you continue in economics. So let's go ahead and put in the rewards, or we'll call it the payoffs, into the payoff matrix, all right? So remember, if Clyde confesses, right, Clyde confesses, and Bonnie confesses also, remember that they each get eight years in prison. Well, let's just throw Bonnie's payoffs right now, right? Okay. But if Bonnie decides to remain silent and Clyde confesses, remember, he confesses and blames Bonnie. Bonnie's quiet. Uh, Bonnie gets the 20 years in prison. So there's, there's her rewards. On the same token, if Clyde decides to uh, remain silent, okay, then Bonnie says, hmm, what should I do? Should I confess? Well, if I confess, I'll go free, okay? or given that Claude's gonna remain silent, and again, if I also remain silent, then neither of us will talk, and I'll only get the one year, because remember, they only have enough um, evidence to convict them for one year. So now let's do the payoff rate matrix for Clyde now, okay? So we're gonna assume that Bonnie will just confess, just assume, and then, and then Clyde's gonna ask, what should I do? Well, he'll ask, if I confess, um, I'll get eight years, remember, because if we both end up confessing, then we both get eight years, because we both implicate each other. And then if I remain silent and, and Bonnie confesses and blames me, then I'm going to get 20 years. So you can already see in this situation which one Clyde would pick. He either gets between 20 or 8 years. All right, now let's pretend that Bonnie's going to remain silent and then Clyde says, what should I do? Should I confess? If I confess and then she remains silent and then I get to go free, if I remain silent and she remains silent, then I only get one year. Um, because they're, they don't have enough uh, evidence to convict us both. All right, so here's the full payoff matrix. Now the question is, what's the Nash equilibrium? Or what will be chosen, okay? The problem here is that confessing is the dominant strategy for both players, all right? No matter what Bonnie does, let's suppose that Bonnie's going to confess. So that means we're in this uh, side, okay, Bonnie will confess. Then Clyde says, well, I have two choices. I can either get eight years or I can get 20 years. I'm going to go ahead and choose confess. So he chooses confess if Bonnie chooses confess. Let's see what happens when Bonnie chooses to remain silent. We're in this square or in this column right here. So let's just pretend Bonnie's going to remain silent no matter what. If Clyde confesses, he goes free. If Clyde remains silent, he gets one year. Well, going free is better than getting one year. So he also picks confess. So this is very interesting. Clyde chooses to confess all the time. And in the same way, Bonnie, you can do this yourself, Bonnie chooses to confess all the time. Since they both choose to confess, that means for sure we're going to end up in this square. Okay? So the Nash equilibrium is where they're both going to confess. The, the big problem is, is that uh, they both really want to be in this square. Right? This would be better for both people. You can kind of think of this like the monopolist. Each of the firms really actually wants to do the monopoly outcome, but the thing is, they have if they both agree to remain silent, um, then Clyde has the incentive to go ahead and cheat to go free, right? Right here. And then Bonnie has the incentive to cheat to go free. See, she's looking to try to get to this square. He's looking to try to get to this square. Since they both end up confessing, they both go to this Nash equilibrium. It's called a prisoner's dilemma because the outcome, the Nash equilibrium, the, pla the place they end up is actually worse 
than if they did the other thing. But there's no way to get to the remain silent, remain silent box. There's no way to get to this box because they both are going to cheat on each other. All right? So they both confess. They get eight years in prison. They would have been better off if they had both remained silent. But even if they had a... We, in this example, said they weren't allowed to talk to each other. But even if they were allowed to talk to each other and they had an agreement, they would both still cheat on each other to try to get to try to go free. They're criminals after all, okay? And they both end up confessing. Oligopolis has the same exact problem. They form a cartel in hopes of reaching the monopoly outcome, but then they become subject to this prisoner's dilemma. They want to cheat. All right, so let's let's go back to the example. T-Mobile and Verizon are duopolis in small town. They want to act as a cartel, remember? That means when they act together like a monopoly and each firm agrees to half of the monopoly outcome. The monopoly outcome was 60 and so they each try to make 30. And uh, let's draw the payoff matrix, okay? So here we have uh, T-Mobile. This is kind of like the good, like, I'm going to follow my agreement with you. Verizon says, I'm going to follow my agreement with you. We'll both make half of the monopoly outcome. And then our, our profits are each $900. That is half of the monopoly profits. That's the best possible thing that these two firms can do right here. And we'll think of this as like the best square possible. But what ends up happening? Well, look at this. If T-Mobile makes the agreement, and you kind of already know this, if T-Mobile makes the agreement to uh, produce 30, his profits are 900. But if he cheats real quick, he gets a thousand. Remember the math we did earlier. So he actually has the incentive to go over here and cheat. Let's see about Verizon. Verizon, they're making 900, but remember if they cheat, they have the incentive to go down here and make a thousand. So they also have the incentive to cheat. We'll call this the good outcome right here. We'll call this perhaps the cheating outcome. All right, uh, cheat. We'll call this the cheating outcome. They cheat, T-Mobile cheats. They end up both getting in this square here, okay? This is called the Nash Equilibrium, or over here, all right? So the Nash Equilibrium doesn't always have to be in this top left corner. It can be wherever on the board uh, it lands, but this is where the, the firms are gonna end up. They would like to end up here. This is their best, let's put a little star here. That's the best outcome that they'd wanna be, but both firms cheat, you know, the prisoner's dilemma, and they end up at the Nash Equilibrium, and they are going to end up here at 800, no matter what they try to do. Okay, so it's a bit of a problem for them. This is actually, it's good for society because now we have lower prices and more quantity of cell phones, which people are going to be more happy. But for the firms themselves, it's, it's a negative because they're losing out on profits. All right, so let's look at another, another game between American Airlines and United. So the choice, they're going to either cut fares by 50% or leave fares alone. All right, so if both airlines both cut fares, their profits are 400 million. If neither airline touches their fares, they get 600 million. But here's the thing. If one airline cuts its fares, everybody flocks to the, the airline that cut its fares and they get all of the profits, whoever cut their, their fares. The fare is another name for the price of the airline ticket. And everybody leaves the other guy that's still expensive and he gets no profit. So there's this incentive to cut the fare to try to maximize the profit. And we're gonna look at this as a prisoner's dilemma also. So I want you to draw the payoff matrix, right? Put one airline on each side and then um, give it two decisions, either stay with the regular price or cut its fares, and then find the Nash equilibrium. Once you've done that, um, you can unpause it and see if you get the right answer. All right, so here's the payoff matrix. I put American Airlines up here. I put United Airlines down here, and they both have two choices, either cut or don't cut. And then I just filled out from the information that uh, I gave you last slide. Right, if they both cut, they both get 400. Um, and then if, if one person cuts, so if United cuts fares and American doesn't cut fares, then United Airlines, see his payoffs right here, um, he gets 800 million, right, because he cut the fares, and so everybody flocks to United, but American didn't flock, or American didn't cut their fares, and so nobody goes to fly on them because they're too expensive. So they have this really bad, um, this really bad profit. So uh, the question is, where are they gonna end up? What is each firm gonna do? Each firm is going to cut fares. 
right? And this is interesting because look at this. This is where they actually want to be, right? They each want to be making 600 million. This is more than each of them making 400 million. But the problem is each um, each firm has this choice, right? United says they're at, they want to be at don't cut fares, and even if they both agree on don't cutting fares, they say we'll make 600. But hey, look, if we cheat real quick, we'll make 800 million. That's the choice between don't cut and to cut, right? And then uh, American Airlines, they agree with 600 million, but the real quick, they're going to say, hey, let's cheat and let's make 800 million. So both people end up cheating to cutting fares, and the Nash equilibrium is this right here. And it, that's where they're going to end up, both cutting fares, which, uh, once again, is better for society because we have cheaper tickets. But in the, for these airlines, it's just a needless waste of profits. Okay? So here's some other examples of Prisoner's Dilemma. Um, two firms spend millions on TV ads to steal business from each other. The firms just, uh, their ads cancel each other out, and both firms' profits are reduced because they have to pay for these really expensive ads. Okay, um, in the ad wars example, actually, this is a real example. Uh, the cigarette companies back in the '70s actually asked Congress to make it illegal to advertise on tobacco on television, right? And everybody was like, "Oh, this is so great! Yeah, we we don't want to advertise on television." But it actually made the tobacco companies firms profits go up because they didn't have to spend any money on on advertising very interesting the other uh, real interesting example is OPEC we call this organization of petroleum exporting countries it's a bunch of Middle Eastern countries that get together and they try to raise the price altogether like as if they were a monopoly when they sell um, when they sell oil but the problem is every single member has uh, incentive to renege or to cheat and so um, this breaks down all the time. All right. Think about uh, two military superpowers, right? They spend billions and billions of dollars on bombs and nuclear weapons. And if both sides could just say, okay, well, look, we're going to stop and we won't produce bombs, they would have a whole lot more money to reinvest in their economies. But they don't because each has the dominant strategy of arming each other. Okay. And then again, the common resources. Remember this back from the common resources chapter. Um, if everyone conserved common resources and didn't overuse like the fish in the ocean or the um, grass patch in the center of town to, to graze our sheep, uh, it would be better off for everybody. But each person's dominant strategy is to overuse, that is to get that, strategy, that resource before anyone else does, and so it ends up being a prisoner's dilemma there. So pretty interesting. This, this prisoner's dilemma happens everywhere in our life actually. Okay, and what, do we, what about society's welfare here? So the non-cooperative oligopoly equilibrium is uh, also known as the Nash equilibrium. We'll call it the Nash equilibrium spot. It's the spot where both people are non-cooperating. They're cheating, right? That's what this means. So when I get to the, the whatever spot that they get to when they cheat is bad for the firms because they have to, they don't get the monopoly profits, but it's better for society, right? Because um, the price drops and it comes closer to marginal cost, and the Q increases. So it might actually be better for society. Um, but in other prisoners' dilemmas, particularly like the common resources one I gave you last slide, this, uh, the Nash equilibrium, the cheating, actually is worse for so social welfare. So in, in the case of oligopolies, the cheating actually ends up being better for society. This is not always the case, OK? Think of the arms race or the overuse of common resources from the previous slide, OK? Here's one last example I'll give you um, of, the, of a prisoner's dilemma that happens every time in every four years, every election cycle. Okay, we have two candidates. We'll call them R and D. I'm not going to say what those stand for. But if R runs a negative ad attacking the D guy, all right, 3,000 fewer people will vote for D. Okay, so D suffers, right? And 1,000 of the people will vote for R. So 1,000 people will switch, but the rest just kind of get disgusted by the... Uh, by the negative ad and they just drop out altogether. All right, and the same thing for the other guy. If Mr. D runs a negative ad attacking Mr. R, then R will lose those 3,000 votes. 3,000 people will drop out. Uh, of those 3,000, 1,000 will go to D, the guy who's running the ad, but the other 2,000 are just kind of disgusted and they drop out. So really, um, because of all these people who 
will get disgusted and drop out. They're like, this is worse for society to run these negative ads, and plus they're annoying for all of us when we watch TV. So they make an agreement to refrain or not attack each other in advertisements. Now the question is, will they stick to it or will they renege? Will they cheat? Let's draw a payoff matrix and let's look, okay? So we'll put, we'll put D down here and he has two decisions, right? Do not run the attack ads, that means to cooperate, or there is the run the attack ads, that means to cheat. So we're gonna ask, you know, which one is he gonna go with this, with this one? Or is he gonna go with this one, right? It's kind of our, it's kind of our question. Well, let's look. Um, if I, I pretend I'm, I'm number, I'm guy number D, and I'm saying, okay, given that R, let's pretend R is going to not r run the attack ads. I have a choice. I can either cooperate, and I have no votes lost or gained, or I can, you know, cheat and run my attack ads. I get a thousand votes. Okay, so in this case, I actually do want to to cheat and run to run the attack ads. Let's look at over here. All right. Um, if I'm, if let's say that guy R is, we're pretty sure he's going to defect or cheat. Okay. If I uh, do what I, we originally talked about, I lose 3,000 votes. But if I also cheat, I only lose 2,000 votes. So it's actually better for me, because I'm guy number D right now, guy D, is better for me to run the attack ads. So I'm actually going to cheat. I'm not going to cooperate. I'm going to come over here and I'm actually going to start a pulling out these attack ads in the, uh, on, the, on the television. So both guys actually end up having the same, the same thing. You can um, check it out for guy R, but each guy ends up cheating and not going with the cooperation, and they both end up losing 2,000 votes. So you see this is, this is where they end up going. Okay, this is the Nash equilibrium. And this is much worse off because really they both want to be here in this box, right? Because they don't they don't uh, lose any votes. But these guys end up being in this box, losing 2,000 votes apiece. This is a really really big problem. And not only uh, do these guys lose lose the votes, but all of us in society we're just uh, very annoyed by these really negative ads. Okay, so both candidates end up running the attack ads. The effect on the election outcome is nothing because the ads cancel out the effects of the other person's ads, but they're afraid not to run the ads because if they don't run the negative ads and the other guy does, then they'll look foolish, right? Okay. So basically all that ends up happening is negative effect on society and that's it. All right. We have lower people coming, more people um, unhappy, and more people who are uninterested in the political cycle. All right. So now that I've told you why people don't cooperate, there are sometimes we do see firms or people cooperating. And so here's a, an interesting thing. When the game is repeated many times, cooperation may be possible. Okay? So here's a, a strategy. If you get to uh, have this interaction, maybe you have the election over and over again against this one guy. And um, you say, hey, look, if you renege or if you cheat in the first round, the first election, I'm going to renege or cheat in all subsequent rounds. I'm going to just cheat forever if you cheat even once. So that kind of scares the other guy into um, cooperating and following their example. And then there's actually this even better um, strategy. It's basically, we call it tit for tat, and it's, it goes like this. Whatever you do, I'll do next time. So if you cheat right now, then next time when we have the election, I'm going to cheat also. But if you're good and you cooperate in this round, I'll cooperate in the next round. And, and actually, studies have shown that it, this very simple strategy, all right, um, if, if you're credible about it and you threaten this, then both sides end up not cheating. And they both end up um, cooperating, which is really good, uh, especially in these situations where the Nash equilibrium is worse for everybody. Okay. And so finally, what should, the, what should the government do towards oligopolies? Well, we know that uh, governments can sometimes improve market outcomes. And the problem is with oligopolies, even in their cheating outcome, the Nash equilibrium, uh, we, we know that production is too low and prices are too high when we compare it to the social optimum. And remember, the social optimum, we get that because the social optimum is whatever the competitive outcome is. That's the social optimum. So we have too little Q and too high prices compared to the perfectly competitive. 
market and we ask what should we do okay and so perhaps uh, what government policymakers can do is promote competition. Remember we spoke uh, a couple slides back about the role of if we open up our country to foreign trade that now enables more companies to come in and compete with these oligopolists and it will drive the marketplace closer to the competitive outcome. So basically we need more companies in the marketplace. That's basically the way to, to get rid of these problems that oligopolists have. Okay. And the, the big problem is when we restrain the trade and antitrust laws, um, they, it doesn't allow more uh, oligopolists to come in. But we do have these things called antitrust laws that um, forbid any sort of collusion between competitors. All right, And it's actually come out a couple of times. It's actually currently illegal if you're the CEO of one company to talk to the CEO of another company about pricing because they're they're collusion and forming a cartel is illegal in America and so any talking about that could lead to forming a cartel is also illegal all right and so of course not everybody's super happy with this antitrust policy um, most people however do think that any sort of price fixing agreements or any sort of collusion where they're trying to become a monopolist should be illegal but um, then there's also the problem that maybe that government policymakers can go too far and they they see something that looks perhaps like a uh, a monopoly cartel starting to form and then they harm the businesses um, when really they weren't trying to do this. It's just really hard to tell when two companies are trying to um, collude together to raise the price or when they're doing something else. Okay. So here's three such practices that are kind of hard to tell what's going on. The first is resale price maintenance. And this happens all the time. Suppose uh, Apple makes an iPad and then they sell it to Best Buy to go ahead and sell it to people. Well, Apple has a lower limit on the price that Best Buy can, can charge. Have you ever realized that uh, really no matter where you go, they always sell the, the, uh, the device for the same price? This is because Apple itself or any manufacturer they impose hey you cannot sell this lower than this price um, it's people think hey this is no good because it's kind of like collusion it's kind of like you know trying to have monopoly pricing the thing is it it really doesn't help the manufacturer at all it actually it helps these other retailers like Best Buy or Amazon or whoever is selling the iPad it doesn't help Apple it actually at all any market power the manufacturer has is at the wholesale level that means selling to the retailers um, at the retail level the level of Best Buy or Amazon or something like that they don't um, it doesn't help them out so it actually might not be a problem this resale price maintenance and it does have a legitimate objective it uh, it prevents people like for example Amazon from selling it cheaper and then saying hey go check out your iPad at Best Buy and then come actually buy it on Amazon.com. It it makes these people quote it's called free writing when they go to Best Buy and just check out the device and then go home to Amazon to buy it for a cheaper price. Then Best Buy just loses all this money because they're paying their sales floor people, but don't actually they don't actually make any sales. So it prevents this problem. Um, but we st there's other ways to get around it too. Sometimes you'll see, uh, like, I don't know, if you're shopping at Walmart online or something like that, it'll say, this price is too low, put it in the cart before you we show you the price. That's because of the resale price maintenance things that are going on. All right, there's also this thing called predatory pricing. And you may have seen this before. Um, so there's a, suppose there's a big firm that's already in the market and they hear that another firm is, there's a startup firm that's trying to come in and take away the market. Well, what they do is they drop the prices drastically, okay, to make the, all the other companies go out of business. And then once it's a monopoly, then it can go back to charging monopoly prices, okay? This is illegal, right? But it's really hard to tell when a, a price cut is predatory or when the firm is just saying, hey, we're trying to do this to help out society so they can buy more of our products. It's, it's really difficult to tell the difference. Um, and furthermore, a lot of economists say, hey, this... If a firm is doing this, it's probably really crazy because you have to sell at a loss, right? You're, the firms are, have to lose money while they're in this super low price phase. And then it might backfire because, you know, once the firm is really weak from selling at a loss for so long, then another firm might come in and be able to take over, okay? 
And the third uh, practice that sometimes people do, and it's hard to tell if this is collusion or not, is something called tying. All right, It's when a manufacturer bundles two products together and sells them for one price. I think Microsoft does this all the time. They uh, sell you Microsoft Windows, and they also give you Internet Explorer, and they come together. Okay, So um, the negatives are that uh, mm, if you bundle a strong product with a weak product, it gives the firm more market power. It enables them to take over more of the market and change the price. But uh, the, the counter argument to that is, you know, if I'm not willing to buy a product that's tied together um, for any more than I'd be willing to pay for the two products separately. So it doesn't actually change market power at all. Um, and, and then finally, firms might try to use tying for price discrimination. Uh, and price discrimination, remember, is not illegal. We learned about it in the Monopoly chapter. Sometimes it can actually increase economic efficiency by eliminating the deadweight loss. Go back to that chapter if you don't remember this. Um, and so if they're doing it for the goal of you know, selling the same product for different prices to different people, that's price discrimination, then uh, actually we might, might be okay with tying occurring. Okay? So basically our conclusion for oligopolies is that they end up looking either like monopolies or like competitive markets, and this depends on how many firms there are and how cooperative they are. If they perfectly cooperate, they'll look like a monopoly. If they don't cooperate at all and, and they have a lot of firms, then they end up looking like a competitive market. Um, anything else, they are, end up being somewhere in the middle. Okay, And the reason why it's difficult, uh, we, we told the prisoner's dilemma story, basically that firms that cheat can never cooperate because they'll just cheat on each other. All right. And uh, finally, what should the government do? Um, kind of on unknown, really. R most people agree that the antitrust laws are a good idea, um, but exactly where they should be applied to is sometimes a gray area.